This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 676, recorded on October 28th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it is 52 Fahrenheit, 11 Celsius here, and very overcast, or as my app calls it, um, we have a lot of haze. <laughs> haze. And it's the same here because I'm 13 miles from Brianne. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. It's cold. <laughs> by Austin standards, 42 degrees, high of 59 this afternoon. We're on the tail end of the cold front. It's gray. It's wet. It's okay with me, actually. And it's going to start to warm up and be nicer later in the week. Wow, so it's warmer here than in Texas? That's correct. But it's headed your way, probably. What's happening to the world when it's warmer here than in Texas? I know. And from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody here. It's 41. And uh, so that's 7 Celsius and it's headed up to 54. I, I misread it. And at first I thought we were already at 54 and we were going to be the warmest of you all. But <laughs> that's just where we're going this afternoon. And it's bright and sunny. It's gorgeous. Really? Nice. Maybe yes. that'll come our way. Yes, I think it will. Yeah, it's been really rainy here all Week, right, yes. Brian? Mm -hmm. It really much. has, yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, I don't know, the weekend was a little dry. I cut the grass on Sunday, yeah. I have to say that this cool weather is good for grass. It's really the lush, it's lushest it's ever been. Grass, I guess, doesn't like hot weather. You guys have real grass. What do you have, weeds? For the last, for the last 30 years, I've lived in places where, you know, they uh, come up with what I would call grass substitutes. mm Okay, they're grass, but they're what we used to call in the north crabgrass, you know, of one sort of relatively tame variety or other. I'm probably going to offend a whole lot of landscape people here. I remember when we went to uh, Texas A&M, you were pointing out the grass around our motel. You said, this is just crabgrass. In the northeast, you call it crabgrass. <laughs> what do you call it? Palmetto grass? Or what's the name? Uh, uh, St. Augustine. St. Augustine. Is the stuff I was talking about, right. But we have a, uh, here in Austin, the, I, I know the listeners are just eating this up. Yeah, we right. have a um, uh, uh, kind of Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass, it, it right. Does, it does Okay. Okay. Um, there are several different varieties of it. One of the problems is it's deciduous. So everything mm. turns brown in the winter. Okay. That's this week in gardening for this uh, this episode. <laughs> Just bear with us. We like the chat. That's part of being the scientist. You come in in the morning. Hey, what's happening? Yeah, my tomatoes died. You know, people chat, so we do it here on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Got it? So don't complain, please. Complain about other things. You know, the next time, well, we're going to record Friday, but then our next Wednesday is the day after election day. I just don't know what to do about it. I don't know if we're going to be able to focus. I don't know if it'll be over yet. It may not I be over. I doubt that it'll be over. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. So, <laughs> nevertheless, moving on, uh, this uh, month and next uh, we well, you could make a donation to Microbe TV via Parasites Without Borders, and they will match it. And so go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. That's through the end of November. And uh, I also want to tell you that uh, we've opened a new Instagram account. One of our listeners, Lauren, decided that this was needed <laughs> to cover all the podcasts. Microbe.tv is the account name on Instagram. Okay, there's a dot in it. Microbe.tv. I didn't know you could have dots in Instagram account names. Uh, but Lauren is putting up summaries of uh, every episode and um, they're really good. They're longer than mine, <laughs> as we were talking about last time. These could actually be press summaries. And then she says at the end, what do you think about this? Send in your comments. So she's engaged, trying to engage people. She picks interesting pictures. She found a picture of Lisa Grilinski, uh, mountain rock climbing or something and put that up. So she's going to do all the podcasts. Pretty cool. 
and I'll be cool. lurking. So, you know, some people are saying, is that you, Vincent? As I'm here, uh, but it's being day-to-day -day run by Lauren, microbe.tv. I just added it. So we are very grateful to Lauren for doing that. Uh, Lauren is a lab worker in Philadelphia. Thank you, Lauren. Um, we are also, I, you may have seen my photo on Instagram um, with a big stack of Principles of Virology 5th edition next to me. And um, I'm going to give most of them away. I don't need all those copies. So uh, we're going to have some contests here on TWIV. We're to, and you have to listen to find out what to do. I'm not telling you now. <laughs> and I may not even tell you this episode. I'm not trying to be mean, but it's a pretty good, it's a sweet deal, as people would say, a sweet deal. And uh, we'll probably have things like poetry writing contests or something. And we're going to have one per volume. Just have to listen. Okay. I'm sorry. You could listen at 2x if you want, but um, this is a cool book. They'll get the They'll get the two volume set though. When yeah, you say one per volume. volume, can you see them right? behind me? I don't know. They're stacked up in the fireplace. Let's see. Uh, mm, I cannot. Yes, Too dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the contest ought to be stuff like uh, you know uh, landscaping in Texas. Right. I, I think so. The Stump weather, grinding. Weather trends in southeastern Michigan. Yeah. So for those of you watching, yeah. here it is. Two volumes. It's still shrink wrapped. And uh, there, see, two volumes. First yeah. volume is a picture of HIV on it. Second volume, picture of SARS CoV 2. On the back, we have Zoom portraits. We were going to, you know, we couldn't get together to get a portrait taken this year. So it's all crappy Zoom pictures. Uh, they're okay, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got mine in the mail on Monday and was really excited. So cool. It looks great. I have to say that this came out, this this was finished really when the pandemic got started. So don't expect a chapter on COVID-19. Uh, maybe, so we have only one chapter. This is a process-driven book, right? Structure, attachment, entry, nucleic acid synthesis, and so forth. And um, there's only one chapter on a specific virus and that's HIV AIDS and because that's because of the extent of the pandemic and the, the impact it's had since the 1980s it's conceivable that we might have a COVID-19 chapter and, uh, however if you know vaccination ends it next year sometime um, uh, it, we might not I don't know it really depends what we learn from it we need to learn new principles and that's what the book is based on so anyway, we're going to give those away. We certainly need to learn from this. Yeah, We do need to learn. And, <laughs> I think and we might. We are still learning. And one of the lessons I'm learning is that you can't rush it, you know? I mean, I have to say these journals just rip out these papers and not all of them are uh, fully baked, as we say. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, they think, oh, we have to get this information out. But getting out weak information is not good. So... There you go. I think that's any PSA from anyone else? Yeah. I know. Nope. 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 Okay. We have a couple of brevia for you today. And the first one <laughs> is just really interesting. It has to do with Neanderthals. <laughs> so but there are two papers we have to talk about. The the main one is called the major genetic risk factor for severe COVID-19 is inherited from Neanderthals. And this was published in Nature. Uh, and uh, unlike most of the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 literature, there are two authors on this paper, uh, Hugo Zeberg and Svante Pabo, who uh, visited Nels a couple of years ago. And Nels said, let's do a Tuivo. And he said, no, I want to go skiing. <laughs> <laughs> so Svante is a big shot. Um you know, he's one of the early people figuring out how to extract nucleic acids from old things like Neanderthal bones, you know, tens of thousands of years old and really made big impact. Yeah, he's on most of the famous ancient DNA papers. Yeah, ancient DNA. And um, he got his start as an adenovirologist. He did. He that's did. how I know of it. He's a good uh, autobiography. 
uh, out there. I read uh, it's 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 really excellent. Anyway, but before we talk about that paper, I wanted to uh, do one that kind of set the stage for this, and that is a New England Journal article. Genome-wide association of study of severe COVID-19 with respiratory failure. And this is published by the G Severe COVID-19 GWAS group, Genome-wide Association Studies, which is the name for trying to put a genome change, a nucleic acid change together with some aspect uh, of disease. And there are lots of people in this GWAS group. I think it's the list is in these supplementary data. There's so many of them. Um, so right. and if you break it down, though, there's um, two two people that uh, seem to be associated as first author and two as last authors. Um, and now I'm trying to find it: um, Ellinghaus and Degenhart for the first authors, and Franca and Carlson for the last authors. Because at least in one of the other papers, they refer to it as Ellinghaus et al. But really, the author list is just the severe COVID-19 GWAS group. <laughs> right. And we talked about some GWAS a few weeks ago, a paper from uh, Casanova in a big group. He was the last author, uh, you know, finding uh, mutations in genes encoding uh, proteins that are involved in interferon signaling pathways. And, um, I mean, the idea is that, you know, there are some risk factors for severe COVID-19 that we know, like old age and comorbidities of various types, but it doesn't explain everything because sometimes younger people get very sick, sometimes older people don't get sick. So there are obviously other issues besides these broad ones. And so the idea here is that you have people with severe disease and, and people with no disease or mild disease and you do genome sequencing and try and say, are there changes, mutations in certain genes that are associated with this? And associated is the key word because you can't prove it uh, because you would have to reintroduce the changes back into someone to show that they get severe disease. And in people, that's obviously impossible, but maybe you could do that in an animal model one day. So that's why it's called a genome-wide association study. So one big difference between this paper and the Casanova paper is that in the Casanova paper, they picked some genes of interest and right. checked to see if those were different. And here they just did sort of a more unbiased approach to see if yeah. um, what they could find. As, as, as uh, Amy Rosenfeld said, they cherry picked some genes. Yes, yes. exactly. And then they could go and, sell, and do experiments in cells and culture and say, ah, these changes do something to virus reproduction. Whereas here, as you will see, they can identify regions not even specific genes, but big chunks of chromosomes where there are sometimes a bunch of genes and say these seem to be associated with it. And so this study, they took patients from Italy and Spain where there are, as you know, lots of serious COVID uh, infections early on. They also had a, a variety of controls from the same company. They had some blood donor controls and a variety of uh, genotype panels from other studies. They had a total, uh, more or less equally distributed between the two countries, mm -hmm. like 1,600 patients and uh, about 2,100 controls. That's a and, lot of and, genomes. And the final comparison involved 835 patients and 1,255 controls from Italy and 755, 775 patients and 950 controls from Spain. And they sequenced their genome and they compared 8 million 965,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms in the Italian cohort and 9,140,000 SNPs in the Spanish cohort. That's how many changes. I, I, I want to double check. You said they sequenced their genomes. Is that what they did or did they just do a SNP analysis? We performed uh, SNP uh, imputation. Yes. Go ahead. I think about things about this is that the SNPs are single nucleotide changes that have been sort of described um, and can be easily examined. Um, and they could change a particular um, gene and thus change the protein. But in a, a lot of ways, we're thinking of them as sort of markers of areas of the chromosome. So we might say that a SNP on a certain area of chromosome five is changed. And that means that some gene 
that is linked to that SNP might be changed. Um, so it's sort of telling you about the area of the, the genome. It doesn't necessarily always tell you exactly which gene is going to be important. But the methodology. Uh, but experimentally in this case, how do we identify the SNPs? Exactly. Is That's that what I'm looking for. I mean, I, my feeling is that you use oligonucleotides and you measure the hybridization and that's what 23andMe does. They do SNP analysis, not sequencing. They used to anyway, they might not anymore. Um, but what is the method? So first of all, you know, SNPs have been defined as being particular sequences that are known to be polymorphic between different genomes. And so they're a defined set of oligonucleotides that are known to be informative when you do these kinds of analysis. You're likely to find differences in different individuals. And they're, they're databases of all these SNPs. Correct. Yes. And um, you can look at those and say, let's look for these in these populations. And we call them, by the way, polymorphisms because the, the concept of mutation isn't correct because at any locus in the human genome, you can find all kinds of variants, right? And who's to say what's a wild type and what's a mutation, right? Um, unless there's something like a deletion and loss of function. But that's why we say polymorphisms. <laughs> right. I'll just tell you that the, for the genetics of susceptibility analysis that we did in my lab, we used a lot of SNPs. And for those, it, we did PCR reactions and determined the uh, genotype. In other words, the genetic information. Okay, that's it. That's at it. that particular region. So you can use we PCR. To, you can use PCR with exactly uh, the the SNP change, and, and if it's not there, it won't amplify, and if it is there, it will amplify. Something like that, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's probably what they did or, here. Or you might you might have to <clears throat> amplify and then sequence your PCR product to determine yeah uh, what it is. Got it. They actually say that they the, in the regular methods they say they performed uh, SNP imputation on genome build blah, 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 using the Michigan Imputation Server. Right. And I looked that up. That's... Um, yeah, Imputation. Uh, he's a, it's an investigator in the uh, School of Public Health who's really big in this whole GWAS methodology. Um, his name slips my mind at the moment, but yeah. All right. So this, uh, by doing this, they find two loci in the human genome associated with uh, severe COVID-19, which they define as uh, respiratory failure. Um, and uh, there's one, and, you know, these are big regions. Um, and they have a nice picture here of all the SNPs. And, you know, there's a lot of noise because there are lots of SNPs throughout all the 23 chromosomes. And then two places, the the dots, which are individuals uh, with these particular SNPs, pop up above the... Uh, the background there it's really a cool image so they're two loci and um, one of and one of them encodes six genes um, of, of, which we'll talk about a bit later and then the other one is associated with the abo blood group uh, substances and you may remember that um, uh, blood groups have been implicated previously right in severity of of COVID-19. And so at this locus, they find that uh, there is a higher risk among people with blood group A than among people with other blood groups. And there's a protective effect for blood group O. And, and it's, this is determined by what is called an odds ratio. It's a statistical computation that compares strengths um, between two events, right? So you say blood group A and severe COVID, right? And blood group B or O and so forth. And um, this, this odds ratio is calculated. And if, it, if the two events are independent, um, they're independent if the odds ratio is one. And if it's greater than one, they're associated. So they give these numbers, you know, odds for group A being associated with more severe risk, it's odds ratio of 1.45. And they're associated in a positive way. Right. If the odds ratio is less than one, then they're associated in a negative way. Right. So the group O is uh, 0.65, right? So that's 
the protective uh, situation there. Right. But as but as we'll see that this is no longer thought to be uh, so important. I mean, this is a you know not a huge study, and others have done more studies. And when we get to the other paper, we'll show that. They also so, so go, go ahead. I was just going to quickly mention, um, I did a little Googling as well, um, and they use the Global Screening Array uh, version 2.0, which is a microarray, um, in order to do the SNP detection. So you have, you have oligonucleotides specific for each of these SNPs on a surface, and then you're putting DNA from the individuals on them. Is that correct? Yes, and then you're looking to see if uh, you get hybridization. Yeah, okay. So if you have a SNP there... Uh, it could interfere with the hybridization. They also looked at human, uh, the HLA region, you know, in, encoding the histocompatibility uh, proteins, which have often been associated with susceptibility to diseases, but they find no uh, relationship, no association with uh, severe disease. And so that, in a way, was um, um, doing the, the non-biased approach, they're saying. Hmm. Yeah. HLA is often associated That's right. with disease. So let's take a look at that and because obviously it didn't pop up in their um, plot that Vincent described a few minutes ago. I don't think you used the term um, Manhattan plot. No, I didn't. But oftentimes <laughs> they are called the Manhattan plots yes. because um, the dots ind indicating each of the individuals um, are placed inside of a bar of a bar graph. Yeah. And so they can end up looking like a, a Manhattan skyline if there are lots of peaks above the um, yeah. level of significance. But yep. in this case, there were only two things. Uh, one was actually right on the line, the ABO blood group. Yeah, right the on level the level of significance. And then the, the uh, chromosome three uh, association was uh, above the line. The red That's really surprising that there's no HLA uh, relationship perhaps because we think of HLA as being really important in um, T cell responses. Um, so they also talk about uh, 24 associations that are uh, of slightly lower significance um, instead of uh, five times 10 to the minus eighth, uh, something that was one times 10 to the minus fifth. And I didn't manage to pull those up yet and look at those to see maybe whether there's HLA or other suspect genes. Maybe some of the interferon uh, response genes might be there or might not. Mm -hmm. From the Manhattan plot, it does look like at that level, there are some things on chromosome six that do come up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this... Um this one, which has the higher, the more dots, the taller skyscraper on the Manhattan plot, six genes, um, which some of which make might make sense in controlling severity. But as they say, a causative gene cannot be reliably implicated by the present data. It's just an association study. One of these genes encodes a sodium amino acid proline transporter, which functionally interacts with ACE2 the cell surface receptor for uh, SARS-CoV-2. I would have loved for them to pull out, uh, what was the other entry factor we talked about last time? Its name oh, is... The, neuro, the neuropillin. Neuropillin. Yeah. It would not have been awesome to pull that out, but mm -hmm. they didn't. That'd be cool. They also, some of these genes encode chemokine receptors, um, and uh, some of which are regulating... Um, locations of lung resident memory CD8 T cells and some other chemokine receptors as well. So these are suggestive, of course, but there's no proof there. They also say that some other some results from the COVID-19 Host Genetics Consortium, which is an independent group doing similar things, find associations at this same locus encoding these, these six genes. Um, right, so that's the locus on chromosome three. And so this is kind of a classic GWAS or... Um, positional cloning type of uh, report where in the discussion then you you talk about your uh, potential candidate genes and why or why, why are they may or may not be uh, related to your phenotype the, the yeah. disease phenotype in this case um, and then it's interesting to see as time plays out as they narrow down the interval and get more specifically, you know, which genes might, gene or genes might be involved, um, yeah. how this, how these predictions 
pan out. So, for example, these chemokine genes, you could take an animal model and if you could delete them, that would be interesting. Or if there's some homology with uh, the uh, human protein, try and make same similar changes um, and see if they have any effect. But that's what you'd have to do if you want to get more information or take cells from people, for example, respiratory cells. So there's a lot you can do. Uh, one thing I thought was cool here, so these SNPs, are, they're, they're big population studies that catalog these SNPs. So you can see global distributions of, of these SNPs and where are they in what countries. So, uh, you know, s suggesting who might be at risk. And then the next paper, they, they actually address that a little bit. And, and then there's the blood group ABO. Um, they don't know why blood group would be associated with um, severity of disease, right? Uh, they, they suggest some mechanisms, but they're all pretty much speculative um, at this point. We've talked about that before. There are some, it's, remember, this is associating a region. Yes. Okay. And there are uh, uh, genes nearby the blood, That's right. blood group antigens that uh, uh, could, you know, in some ways make sense that have to do with, uh, uh, I think, innate immunity. The one thing I want to point out here that becomes more uh, relevant in the next paper is that if you look at the figure mm -hmm. uh, on the, um, the summary figure, figure two, mm -hmm. the uh, blood group peak barely makes significance. Yeah, that's right. Okay? Whereas the other no, it's above it, is yeah. uh, much uh, more significant. In fact, I, I'm i not sure quite uh, how to look at this, but if I look at the um, the maximum uh, sample uh, comparing the uh, a chromosome three hit with the blood group hit, it's like uh, over, it's about 200 times uh, the magnitude of mm -hmm. the blood group hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I happen to be blood group O, which obviously explains why I have never been infected. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. What are you guys? Do we, do you, oh. you're O also? E. Wow. B. I'm A. I'm interesting. Uh, you know, that's why I'm staying home. <laughs> <laughs> now, just a note to listeners. This doesn't mean that if you're O that you can just do anything you want. This is an association. It doesn't mean that it's, you're protected, right? In fact, Wear a all, mask. Everybody wear a mask. In fact, all this is doing is saying what, is, what leads to severe disease. It doesn't say what is protective, okay? so. And in the case of the blood group, it's really tenuous. Very tenuous. Best. Yeah, very tenuous. Now- uh, the next paper is, is what caught my eye because I, I love these studies done with Neanderthal and ancient DNA of all sorts, right? And as I said earlier, Pabo's group was the um, pioneer here. And you should read his autobiography. He talks about the the uh, how he got into this and the, the race to do it. And, you know, these bone fragments are really precious. So, you know, he goes to a museum and says, I want a piece of your, your Neanderthal bones. And they're like, no. Because it's destructive, right? When they take the DNA out, it's destructive. And he has to figure out what other contaminating DNA there is there. And there are all ways to do that. And one of them is mitochondrial sequences. Anyway, major genetic risk factor for severe COVID-19 is inherited from Neanderthals. Damn those Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true homo sapiens. Um so they mentioned here this study that we just went over, two regions um, of, uh, associated with uh, severe COVID-19, one on chromosome three where the six genes, including some chemokine, chemokine receptor genes, and one region on chromosome nine for the which includes the ABO blood group uh, genes. So they say recently a new data set was released from the Host Genetics Initiative where the region on chromosome three is the only region significantly associated with severe COVID at the genome-wide level. And that's kind of what we we're suggesting from that Manhattan plot because the ABO is right there at the significance line. The risk variant in this region confers an odd ratio for requiring hospitalization of 1.6. Can we say anything about that number 1.6? Like in practical terms, what does that mean? 
Uh, no, Catholic, um, yeah. I tried to do my best to understand it with respect to the QTL measure that I'm familiar with, which mm. is the logarithm of the odds. And I know that, for instance, if the logarithm of the odds is three, then it means the probability of the association um, uh, being, let's see, how do I put that? The the probability that these things are truly associated associated is a thousand to one. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you take the logarithm of 1.6, it's not that big of a number. Yeah. So I did find some charts that compared logarithm of odds or LOD scores with odds ratios. And hmm. to me, these are, these are kind of tenuous. <laughs> they're small. Uh, they're numbers. small. They're small. You're um, saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so anyway, the, um, this is 49,000 bases we're talking about on chromosome three, a stretch of 49,000 bases. And they say there's previous studies where they have sequenced genomes of Neanderthals and Denisovans, right? Have shown that pieces of the chromosomes of in Homo sapiens have descended from uh, these individuals. So they said, first, let's see: is this uh, is, is this region on chromosome three that it come from uh, Neanderthals or Denisovans? And so they found, in fact, um, they're associated with Neanderthals. There's there are a number of Neanderthal bone sets that have been excavated. Uh, one of them is called Vindija, Vindija, 33.9 Neanderthal, a 50,000-year-old from Croatia in southern Europe. Um, and of the 13 SNPs that make up this uh, haplotype associated with severe COVID-19, 11 of them, 11 of them are in a uh, homozygous form in this Vin- Vindija 33.9 <laughs> Neanderthal. That's pretty good. And uh, three of these uh, variants also occur in a different Neanderthal, the Altai and the Chagirskaya 8 Neanderthal, both of which are from the Altai Mountains in southern Siberia. So the first one, the Vindija, is 50,000 year old, years old, and these two are 120,000 and 50,000 years old, respectively. So Neanderthals are walking around 50,000 years ago. So I, uh, this got me on a, <laughs> uh, this got me on a Neanderthal kick, <laughs> which of course took me uh, directly to Wikipedia. So I pasted this uh, graphic from Wikipedia in here. Anybody can look it up that shows uh, yeah. a sort of a nice graphical summary of the uh, that basically shows the interbreeding, mm-hmm. uh, the coexistence of Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans. And uh, I suppose, well, what became Homo sapiens if it wasn't exactly Homo sapiens at the time uh, and where they came from and uh, the extent to which they uh, mixed. But suffice it to say, that those three species were walking around at the same time. Well, they were doing more than walking around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because we have uh, the Homo sapiens ultimately was the dominant species that survived for reasons that uh, people can really only guess at. Uh, but uh, in the process, mixed it up some with both the Denisians, uh, De- Denisovans, and the Neanderthals. Mm, okay. And we're left with some of their DNA. So the the result here, this is all computational analysis, is that uh, these some of these uh, risk alleles were present or SNPs were present in Neanderthals, but not Denisovans. All right. Now next they say, did we did we actually both get them from an ancestor of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens? Right. And so we don't want to just blame the Neanderthals. Maybe we we got it from a common ancestor because there is a common ancestor. And they say the way they do this is interesting. The longer a human haplotype is shared with Neanderthals, the less likely it is to come from an ancestor because there's recombination uh, in our chromosomes and it would break up uh, the haplotypes into smaller segments. So they can use that and they make some assumptions about generational time and recombination rate. And they basically conclude that... uh, uh, there's no, this haplotype came from Neanderthals, not from a common ancestor. So somehow it arose in Neanderthals and passed down to Homo sapiens. 
Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. So because it's a pretty long region mm. of nucleotide sequence that seems to be shared, that indicates that it couldn't have come from a common ancestor because there would have been recombination right. uh, over right. time. But it's, right. it's pretty long, so it, it implies that the uh, uh, introgression, as it were, maybe, yeah. um, it has been more recent than the common ancestor. I think this is just Rich's, Rich's image really helps on that because you could imagine uh, which pathway the gene is coming on, whether it's coming from Heidelbergensis um, yeah. to both mm -hmm. Neanderthal and Sapiens or down that Neanderthal pass. And you can see that the Neanderthal pass would be much shorter um, and thus less time for recombination. Right. This is uh, nature's versions of nature's version of the uh, human ex, uh, equivalent of Lisa Grolinski's collaborative cross. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. That's right. So I'm envisioning sometime, you know, one or two hundred thousand years ago, a child of a um, uh, Homo sapiens or close to Homo sapiens and Neanderthal, who's 50% Neanderthal and 50% Homo sapiens. And that child uh, over time breeds almost exclusively with Homo sapiens, uh, generations after generations. So the Neanderthal DNA gets uh, diluted out. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. All right, so this, this was, um, so as I say, the risk haplotype entered the, the modern human population from Neanderthals. And so this sequence is expected to be more similar to the Neanderthal genome than to other haplotypes currently in the human population. And so they look at this, they analyze all the available haplotypes in the thousand genome uh, collection for this region. And they find that all risk haplotypes associated with severe COVID-19 in this chromosome three form a clade with the three high coverage Neanderthal genomes. And they're most closely related to the Vindesia 33.19 Neanderthal, 50,000 year old Neanderthal from Croatia. Interesting. It's just fascinating how this, and you know, there are a lot, a lot of not a lot of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens around at the time. So you can imagine how these, these genes could spread. Then, then the interesting thing is, where are these haplotypes present on the planet in, uh, in humans? The, these Neanderthal-derived haplotypes are almost completely absent in Africa, which of course is consistent with the idea that the gene flow uh, from Neanderthals into African populations was very limited and probably indirect via other uh, others. In South Asia, 30%, the, the haplotype, the Neanderthal haplotype occurs in the population at about 30%. In Europa, 8%. In, among admixed Americans, 4%. And lower frequencies in East Asia, highest frequency, Bangladesh, more than half of the population, 63%, carries at least one copy of the Neanderthal risk haplotype. 13% of the population is homozygous for this haplotype. Um, so this means that it could be a contributor to risk in certain populations. And they say that um, individuals of Bangladeshi origin in the UK have two times higher risk to die from COVID-19 than the general population. And they uh, you know, provide statistics for that. So that's very that's very interesting. But again, as Kathy so, mentioned, the, the actual <clears throat> risk seems not huge, all right, but is something. Yes, yes, Rich. Once again, looking at the Wikipedia article, I'm looking at the range of Neanderthals, and they basically, they didn't hang out in Africa at all. No, this is uh, way past the the origin yeah. of the of the species, and uh, they're uh, in Europe and some in the Middle East, uh, and then also uh, in areas uh, as far away as uh, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Iran. Very interesting. So overall, we have Homo sapiens is about 3% Neanderthal DNA, correct? And um, you can see that bits of it are more present in some populations than in others, like this risk haplotype. Uh, the risk... Uh, haplotype occurs at a frequency of 30% in South Asia, but it's absent in East Asia. 
And so they say must have been, may have been affected by selection. And so what is the selection that would select for this risk haplotype, right? We don't know. Um, it could be protection against other pathogens, which is always something you suggest, but you just don't know because it's too long ago to know anything. Uh, they so say that would maybe be positive selection. In the, other words, it's an advantage to yeah. have this because it helps to protect you against something else. Yes, right. it turns out to be bad for SARS-CoV-2, but good for something else. Yeah, um, they say maybe negative selection from other coronaviruses, which would, you know, kill people. And they say it's mean expanding that a little bit, meaning that over the course of history, coronaviruses have wiped out those people that had that. And so that was negative selection for those right. genes. So in places so that's why there's less yes, in some like, populations. Yes, like East right. Asia, it's almost absent. So one idea would be, uh, yes, it was negative selection. And they say it's now under negative selection due to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, although I, I remember Rich months ago saying that, you know, so far, and a lot of people have been infected and died, but it's just hardly anything in terms of the whole population of Earth, right? So, um, you know, I'm not sure how much negative selection is. is no, there's not a real strong selection. Yeah. And I think, um, uh, I think this uh, uh, in our current society strikes, uh, selects uh, more strongly for behavior than anything else. I'm mm. yeah, sorry, being cynical. I can't. I, 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 <laughs> I detected can't help that. myself. I detected so, uh, that, yes. Um, uh, uh, confirming your percentage DNA once again. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I've got that Pabo book on my shelf. Did you read I've it? I've got to read it. Oh, you no, didn't I read, it. read it. That's very good. Excellent. I'm book. still hung up in the Civil War. <laughs> it's good too. Me down. It's good too. So uh, one to depending on where you're from, one to eight percent. But if you kind of do a rough average, is three percent comes out about right. Yeah, and but some then of the for this particular region the. the of the genome, it's really, really high within the Bangladeshi yes. population. Right. So it's something went on to do that, right? right. Okay, and then um, the, the last sentence is wonderful. With respect to the current pandemic, it is clear that gene flow from Neanderthals has tragic consequences. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. That's rather... Dark. It is dark. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we also acquired some good things from Neanderthals. So, uh, there have been other studies showing that uh, good protective, in fact, some immune genes, we've done this on Tuivo, came from Neanderthals that are good. Um, and so you, uh, that makes sense to keep things that are useful, that are beneficial for the species, right? And so there must be a reason why this, as we've said, is, is in some populations, but not others. It's the same thing with the, the deletion of CCR5, right? In what, 4 to 16% of the world's humans, which confers resistance to some uh, HIV. We don't know what's selected for that um, in the past. And people have speculated maybe some other pathogen, but we just don't know. Right. We don't even know if something did select for it or if there was just a lot of genetic drift uh, or, you know, founder effects. The classic yeah. for the listeners out there, uh, maybe you already talked about this while I was away in Wikipedia, <laughs> uh, but the, <laughs> the classic protective effect of what otherwise in other circumstances appears as a deleterious mutation is sickle cell anemia. Mm -hmm. As if you're heterozygous for the sickle cell trait, if you have the sickle cell trait, uh, it confers uh, some re resistance to malaria. Uh, but uh, in... Uh, so if you're in an area that's exposed to malaria, that's a good thing to have. There's a positive selection there. But otherwise, in particular, if you're homozygous, it causes lots of problems. Okay. Any other comments before we move on? All right. We have a paper, Journal of Infectious Diseases, was uh, sent by Kathy this week. Prolonged SARS-CoV-2 replication in an immunocompromised patient. Uh, from uh, Bang, Smith, Mirabelli, Valesano, Monte, Bachman, Vobus, Adams, Washer, Martin, and Adam Loring, um, I guess is the corresponding author there. And this is from uh, a, uh, 
Kathy's neck of the woods, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Wow. Right. And uh, <laughs> at least two of these people have been on TWIB in the past. Christiana Vobus was mm -hmm. on 243. And I'm trying to find the one when Adam Loring was on. It was when uh, you were department on. You got were, the, uh, yeah. micro, um, the micro ASM Milestones in Microbiology Award. That's right. Um, you were on it as well as several others. Yes, mm -hmm. I remember that very well. 360. Thank you. Gosh, you're just a good resource, Rich. Hey, dude, yeah. <laughs> all you got to do is just uh, TWIV and then whatever keyword you want, all kinds of stuff pops up. All right. Yep. So the, the, I like the introduction here. It has a very nice uh, summary of what goes on in your typical infection with SARS-CoV-2. So average incubation period, five days viral load, peaks around the time of the symptom onset. Shedding occurs for about two to three more days. And they say viral peak viral loads in asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals are similar. Um, but those with symptom appear to shed viral RNA for longer periods of time. You can be positive for nucleic acid up to six weeks after symptom onset. Uh, but And when people have looked for infectious virus by putting you know, nasopharyngeal samples or saliva into cell culture, they can find no infectious virus in typically after seven days. All right, so if you're positive after that by PCR, it's just non-infectious. Uh, and uh, mo they say, this is cool, most contact tracing studies have indicated that individuals are most infectious within five days of symptoms. Of course, that's the whole basis for the MENA assay, right? You just need to know that period when you're infectious when you're shedding a lot of infectious virus. But the real key is, what about immunocompromised people? Uh, there, there are two kinds, I guess, people with genetic uh, deficiencies that lead to immunocompromise, and then there are people who are being immunosuppressed for various reasons, transplants or for cancers, as the case in this, this study. A man who's being treated with for, with various immunosuppressive drugs for refractory mantle cell lymphoma. Does anyone know what a mantle cell is? Is, it, is that by my fireplace behind me? Uh, it, is, uh, <laughs> uh, it is of the B cell lineage. Yes. Okay, so this is basically a B cell lymphoma. And so I think part of the drugs they're giving him are, are monoclonals against B cells, right? To try yeah, I and believe that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're actually um, giving monoclonals against B cells as well as a number of other immunosuppressive drugs. He's he's actually quite immunosuppressed if you look at the full yeah. list. So he first comes to the emergency department with epistaxis and cough. Somebody remind me, what's epistaxis? Bloody Mostly. nose, dude. Bloody nose. <laughs> I had to I had to look that one up. And uh, I'm building uh, I'm building weird vocabulary in my grandson Porter. That's what doctors so I say. Out, <laughs> I rushed out and told him uh, added to his vocabulary. It says ep uh, epistaxis, dude. There's uh, a whole bunch of these neat terms. Coriza. Yeah. It's another mm -hmm. one. I can't remember uh, the one for loss of smell is great. And anosomia, right? Anyway, epistaxis right. and cough productive blood streak sputum. All right. So he's on chemotherapy for part of for his cancers, right? Uh, uh, and by the way, you don't want to get uh, mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, that That's a one-way trip as I read the mm -hmm. Wikipedia article. It's a lot of lethality, essentially yeah. in the long run palliative care. The five-year survival rate is 50%. So this is what he's, he's getting. Um, he's getting a Antibody that reacts with both CD20 and CD3 T cells, cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, prednisone, and another monoclonal directed against uh, CD79. So he's being severely immunosuppressed, as Brianne said. All right, so he comes to the ER. He's got a fever, but he doesn't need oxygen. Chest no, X. He's not feverish. I said he, fever. he wasn't feverish. I didn't. Oh, okay. I said Sorry, he, I misheard. Uh, he did not require oxygen. His chest uh, x-ray was okay, but he had a nasopharyngeal swab positive for SARS-CoV-2. What was the CT value? Does anyone know? It's on figure 1A. Can someone tell That's me? That's what's cool in this paper is that the CT values are all there. So I'm curious at, about that. Uh, when he first came in, CT value uh, around 11. 12. 7. Yeah, they did two different genes, 11.7, oh, 12.4. He's, 11 .7, 12 .4, he's so. burning up, man. That's a ton of RNA. Holy cow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. 
All right, so this yeah, the, guy... The, the whole course of the disease, the highest CT value is uh, 27. Yeah, he's making a lot of uh, RNA. So he gets admitted uh, because he's on chemotherapy. They want to monitoring him. Um, he got a platelet transfusion. His symptoms uh, imp improved, and he went home six days later. It's all happy. I'm happy as a clam. I'm good. I beat COVID. However, he continues to be tired and has a cough. Uh, he didn't have a fever. Starts to have shortness of breath, goes to the emergency department. Now we're on day 22 after the first <laughs> symptom onset. Again, no fever, no no oxygen needed. His chest x-ray now, well, CT, he's got multiple bilateral lung nodules with ground glass opacity. So he's, he's got lung damage. Again, a new swab, nasopharyngeal swab positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and and, and uh, so he's admitted... Um, but then becomes febrile in hospital and he starts to need oxygen. Uh, and day 29, he's got more PCR done and it's positive for SARS-CoV-2. My PCR, you can find all these CT values in the figure, right, uh, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this <laughs> yeah, is a great figure. Uh, yeah, it is. Very well done. And by day 30, serology, no antibodies. Wow. Guess what? You get immunosuppressed. <laughs> it don't make yeah. antibodies. So they're going, oops, this is not good. We better do something. So they give him remdesivir, which is a 10-day course of treatment. Then on day- So remind us what remdesivir is going to do. Remdesivir is, an, is a uh, going to inhibit viral RNA synthesis, basically. Right. So it's a direct acting antiviral. And it's really the only one we have right now, which has to be given intravenously. But fortunately, he's in hospital. Then the next day, he gets convalescent plasma therapy. And then his fever goes down. So this is a passive immunization. He's getting serum from someone who had recovered from SARS-CoV-2 and the serum is going to have antibodies right. directed against the virus. Now, they say he's, his sputum is still positive uh, for SARS-CoV-2 on day 33 and 38. What are the CTs there? Do we know? Um, 33 is, the CT is 24. On day 38, the CT was 21.6. He's still making quite a bit of RNA. Mm -hmm. nope. Yeah, it's actually really surprising. Um, so he was discharged around day 14 mm. and the CT on day 12 was 13.5. Wow. Yeah. That's I'm guessing that this was early enough on that they didn't have many other options and- yeah. Maybe. Felt like he had improved somewhat and mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So this time, day 39, he goes home. He goes for a telemedicine visit. Well, he's, that's home, right? You call in day 60, he's okay. And then he gets more serology done at day 66. They find IgG to SARS-CoV-2. Um, they uh, do some outpatient nasopharyngeal swabs at days 46, 57, and 66, all positive. And I'm guessing they're pretty low CT values because you said the highest one was not very high. I think those are the ones done at another yeah. uh, place and they don't report those CT okay. values. Okay. They, and the antibody positivity is most likely because of the convalescent right. serum, exactly. not because of anything the patient has made yeah. themselves. Because the patient is still being immunosuppressed, so they're not likely to be making his own antibodies. Uh, again, day 81 remains positive for SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And they say the decision was made to reinitiate lymphoma treatment given his relatively high CT values. Mm. Rel so 27 like, at yeah. that point. I'm sure these are really, really tough calls. Yeah. Yes, okay. Because right. you're, oh, yeah. you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, uh, tread uh, a path between the viral disease on the one hand and his lymphoma on the other hand. Yeah. This must be yeah. very difficult. All right. So they reinitiate chemotherapy on day 85. He's finished on day 106. Uh, and the same day he has mild upper tract respiratory tract symptoms and his nasopharyngeal swab is positive. For SARS-CoV-2. This guy must uh, be for thinking- For RNA. Well, for RNA, we'll yeah. get back to that. Yeah. Uh, this guy must be thinking, what do I have to do to avoid this? Day 119, he comes to the ER with fever, cough, shortness of breath. He's got chest radiograph shows new lung damage. All right? Not the old one, but something new in different places. 
Um, and then it, uh, his two days later, he's admitted, and he's two days after admission, he has a worse chest radiograph, increasing oxygen requirement. On day 122, he's given a second course of remdesivir, a 10-day course, and convalescent plasma. His fever goes down. He's weaned off oxygen and discharged on day 131. This is like heroic, right? Yeah. Wow. One other thing that's really interesting here is on the awesome figure, um, they note that on day 116, he was again IgG negative. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of indicates that the previous time when he was antibody positive was from that convalescent plasma. When was he given the, uh, the first convalescent uh, plasma? 33. Uh, 30 something? 33. So that's the length or of no, the, no, between around 30. Around 30, yeah. 30 to 116 is how long the, the antibodies last, right? And I want to yeah. note that he was uh, discharged to in-home hospice care. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, then he's readmitted on day 156 for the lymphoma. And they do a swab, right? You have to be checked for SARS-CoV-2. He's positive. CT 22.5, pretty substantial virus, right? Uh, and then he goes to hospice, as uh, Rich says. And uh, we don't know. That's the last uh, point we have from this individual, right? Mm-hmm. Now, this uh, being at the University of Michigan, they look for uh, infectious virus in cell culture. Yay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So my, my, uh, my, uh, it looks to me from the methods that what they did was uh, basically in retrospect, went back and collected, uh, uh, recovered all of these yeah. samples yep. Yep. and then did culture. That's studies. good. That's good. It could be that it was uh, approval timing yeah. that, mm-hmm meant that they had to wait till they got the approval to do those things. Yeah, you need an IRB protocol sure. and it takes yeah. time, yeah. So they take the uh, these samples from day 7, 12, 22, 29, 33, 38, 81, 93, 106, and 119. Wow. And they put them on uh, Vero cells and culture and all except day 81 produce CPE. Now, that means there's some infectious virus there. We don't know how much, right? So mm-hmm. could be mm-hmm. not much or could be a lot. It would be nice to quantify, but at this point, they just want to know. From day 7 through 119, that this patient has not shedding infectious virus. And then, of course, they see, because Adam Loring is involved, they sequenced all of these genomes and looked at uh, how they're varying. And they say, this is all the same virus. This person is not being reinfected. He's harboring the sequence analysis of all these isolates indicates that it's the same virus, which is actually evolving in the patient. You're seeing changes as it goes on in time, but it's obviously the same uh, virus that he started with, not reinfection. And and the way they do that is that they take samples, 100 samples from other patients at the same hospital yeah. and sequence those, and they're different yeah. on the phylogenetic tree. So they say in-host evolution and therefore replication of SARS-CoV-2 over a four-month period. And then they do some analysis of all these banked sera for uh, antibodies. Day 30 negative for total antibodies against nucleocapsid, spike, receptor binding domain, spike S1, S2, and spike, all different parts, nucleocapsid and spike. And then positive for nucleocapsid on day 60 and marginally positive on day 88. Um, remain negative for anti-spike throughout, uh, even after receiving plasma. It's not clear whether this represents seroconversion or decay administered in the convalescent plasma. Day 120, negative for all antibodies and became marginally positive for nucleocapsid after the second administration of plasma. So I wonder what's uh, ongoing with this individual. But you can see in an immunocompromised person, in this case immunosuppressed by uh, chemotherapy, you can harbor virus for a long period, which is not surprising, right? We Not surprising. It makes sense. And so... um, But it's one of those things that, while not surprising, it's important to have the actual data. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we have talked in the past about, right, Ebola virus, these kinds of long-term infections, um, you know, in viruses that we say are acute, they come and go and they're done. We find examples of long-term infections, even polio vaccine given to uh, people uh, who can't make antibodies. Uh, they shed them for years. 
the shed polio vaccine for years, and they're actually a problem for eradication because we actually we don't know where they are most of the time. They don't get sick, and they're shedding polio vaccine for years. Uh, yeah, you, uh, it's an important point that this is an extreme case that shows that this uh, can happen, uh, and it basically, in my mind, opens the door to the possibility that there may be much more cryptic cases out there. Uh, people who are mildly immunosuppressed and may not even know it, okay, in some in some fashion, and could carry an infection for a long period of time. I'm making that up, but your polio example what's, is what brings that to mind. Yeah. No, I mean a lot of people are on such chemotherapies, so it's likely that there are other cases of prolonged shedding, and who knows if they are transmitting, right? There, uh, you might want to take people who are being immunosuppressed and be particularly careful with them, I suppose. Right. That's uh, one of the things they say in the very end of the discussion is that um, it's not probably going to be feasible to, for these individuals, sample them and test whether they have infectious virus. But maybe you can use surrogates like yeah. low CT values um, and no seroconversion as right. indications that these people might be shedding infectious virus for much longer than immunocompetent individuals. Right. So a couple of other tidbits that are of interest in the discussion. First, they say, it's clear that SARS-CoV-2 RNA can be detected in clinical specimens long after a patient becomes culture negative, and culture positivity has not been identified past 20 days. That's what's been published before this, of course. Um, viral RNA detected after two weeks of illness is of unclear significance and favor basing isolation decisions on time since symptom onset, Right. And that's where CT value can be of help, right? Because if you have, I think the current idea is at 34 and above, you're very unlikely to be transmitting. In fact, that's where the president was at 34, I think. And that's why his yeah. his, um, spokes, his doctor said he can't transmit. And that's it's right. He probably can't transmit. Although it's never black and white. You never know, right? But that's probably it. <laughs> Um, yes, so this is important. First to report, immunosuppressed person can shed for many weeks, and so we have to be on the lookout for this. I presume uh, that uh, the, all of these culture results emerged after uh, this whole time course that we're talking about. Uh, and I would presume further that the you know physicians and et cetera are not dumb about this. They know that they're sending somebody home who probably has an active infection and shedding virus. And I assume that that's done with appropriate precautions. But in this particular case, uh, you know, what are you going to do? You're not going to, just because this person uh, uh, is infectious, you're not going to keep them in isolation in the hospital indefinitely no, okay for no. their own well-being and for the well-being of others well it makes more sense to send them home with appropriate precautions that's daniel talked about this early on he said you know we have patients who are remain pcr positive we, for one two months you can't keep them in the hospital they're they're not sick anymore you have to either discharge them to another and many of them go to um you know care places and you can't you can't put those at risk so yeah, you, they had to make decisions early on uh, about that. It's a very difficult. Now we understand that uh, the CT value is important and can guide that, but also the timing, right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of where you are post-symptom uh, onset. Yeah. And they also note, and I wanted to point out that this is what we call a case study. So in this case, it's N of one. <laughs> this is one individual that we have all this data about. Right. Um, and so- we can't make global sweeping conclusions from it, but I think we still learn a lot based on the kinds of things that they've done here in sampling Absolutely. this individual's Absolutely. serum and um, virus sequences and so forth over time. Yeah, case studies are very important for guiding care. Now other physicians who are treating patients in this way will have to be aware of this, right? And this can, mm -hmm. can guide them. So yes, very important. One more brevia. Uh, I've, there was an article, a, an opinion this week uh, by Krugman in the Times about the Great Barrington Declaration. I wanted to let you know about. It has some interesting back back information. 
which I think Alan Dove alluded to, but it's a little more specific. Atlas and other administration officials. So Scott Atlas is the president's uh, go-to person for COVID-19, but he is, of course, not an infectious disease person or an epidemiologist, and his views have been widely criticized. Atlas and other administration officials have reportedly been strongly influenced by the Great Barrington Declaration, a manifesto on behalf of herd immunity that grew out of a meeting at the American Institute for Economic Research. What do we know about this institute? Well, it is not surprisingly linked to the Charles Koch Institute. And a perusal of his website reveals that until recently, it devoted much of its time to climate denial, putting out articles with titles like, Brazilians should keep slashing their rainforest. More recently, however, the Institute's focus has shifted to COVID denial. Last month, for example, it published an article lauding Governor Kristi Noem of South Dakota, whose refusal to take action against coronavirus has turned her state into what the article called a, quote, fortress of liberty and hope protected from the grasps of overbearing politicians. End quote. Since then, of course, South Dakota has experienced an explosion of infections and soaring hospitalization and is now seeing a rapid rise in COVID-19 deaths. So, um, I, you know, I've had many conversations with people who say, oh, there's so many academic types and clinicians on this Barrington Declaration, but it's being pushed by this institute with a, an agenda. And as Rich said, there's no data in the declaration. So you have to look at the data. I've had many interviews where people say, well, what are these professors and doctors? How do I take that? I said, you have to look at the data and there are no data here. You're smart. You can figure it out. If there's no data, go look for it. And if there's not, just don't believe it, right? Okay. Listen to the crickets, man. <laughs> hey. Are you guys you know, stunned? What you else are you going to say? Yeah. You said it all. Uh, yeah, it's really sad. Anyway, let's do some email. Wear a mask. <laughs> Wear a mask. I swear to God, if everybody could get on board with this, it would make just all the difference in the world. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a big deal. We're not asking much. Kathy, can you take the first one? This is from Anonymous. Yeah. Hi, TWIV team. I thought you'd be interested in this ad 5 vectored vaccine that includes nucleocapsid in addition to spike. The ad 5 backbone has been in cancer patients and has been modified to evade anti-ad5 antibodies. They just started phase one. I was injected yesterday with the low dose, and they will be tracking T-cell responses in addition to the antibody response. And Anonymous sends the link. Thanks for all you do to spread good science. So I haven't taken a look at this. I don't know anything about it. I think we've uh, briefly mentioned this before. It's a it's an ad with both spike and nucleocapsid genes uh, mm. in it. So, which is good because a lot of the T cell epitopes are in nucleocapsid. So that may be yeah. good. In fact, most of them are not in spike. Uh, I, I read a paper recently. Most of the T cell epitopes are not in spike. They're actually elsewhere. So, and nucleocapsid is one of them. So maybe this is good. It's in very early phase, right? Phase one. Um, but it's a human adenovirus 5, right? Right. And the company is Immunity Bio. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't heard of that So the, the, one of the things that interests me about this is that uh, they, I'm looking at the link, is this idea that this vector circumvents pre-existing adenoviral immunity. Oh, yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And they, uh, they say... The second generation adenovirus platform has four deletions, which overcome pre-existing adenoviral immunity, allowing for multiple administration. Right. Um, so, Kathy, where would those deletions be? Would they be in yeah. exon or fiber? I, I, would, I would guess they would be, yeah, hmm. probably in hexon, fiber. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so you can map Maybe on antibody it. binding sites and then take them out. That's cool. Very cool. Uh, they, so this is a nice uh, article. This It's from the company website. They give all the details on the the trial design, right? Um, and they can make 100 million doses a year. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. So I'll be interested to see what happens with this multi-antigen thing. I had a, uh, this, uh, I did an event, as I said before, with, uh, 
Matt Freewin and uh, Lisa Grilinski a week or so ago. And <clears throat> Matt had some information about uh, a potential downside to actually having nucleocapsid as an antigen along uh, with uh, spike. So I don't, you know, I don't have enough, uh, uh, I don't have enough insight to go any further than that, other than to say, it'll be interesting to see how this works out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rich, can you take the next one? Mike writes, greetings to my favorite support group. <laughs> when listening to episode 674, Rich mentioned Alan Alda's Clear and Vivid podcast. Did you know he played Dr. Robert Gallo <laughs> in the movie and the band played on? Wonderful movie about the emergence of HIV and the politics that ensued. Get him on this show. <laughs> Love to all of you. <laughs> Regards, Mike. So yeah, let's get Alan on the show. I never saw that movie. I did read the book, but uh, I, I have I same here. The movie is uh, better than the book. Really? Okay. Yes, I had seen the movie before I read the book, and I uh, felt like I enjoyed the movie much more. I don't know how to get in touch with Alda. Um, so if anyone knows, let me know. I mean, I could tweet at him, but that that's never worked in the past. Um, so I, I need to get in touch with a publicist. So, I mean, know how to do that. Yeah, my guess is he has people, right? He has people. <clears throat> so, yeah, it somehow start at Stony Brook, where his institute is. Yeah, maybe there's a, a administrator for the institute. Yep. I could say we had Tony Fauci on. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people on, actually, that are quite cool. Uh, Brianne actually, can, you got enough to do, Vincent. You want me to take this on? You, you're welcome to, yeah. I, I I'll 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 give it a rip. Rich is good I with like the celeb kind of Rich stuff. is good with the celebrity interactions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Do that. And and remember, Kathy wants to be on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a fan of Alan Alda? Oh yeah. 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 Uh, he came and gave a talk here about his uh Communicating Science Institute. So that was really fun. It was in a pretty small auditorium. So cool. I felt like I was very close. Oh, by the way, um, a number of people, including Brianne, have uh, told me that Twib was mentioned on, what is it, Brian Lehrer? Yes. Yeah. What is, uh, what is the name of his show? It might be the Brian Just, Lehrer show. Yeah, Brian I think Lehrer. that's right. Yeah, Dixon emailed me. He's Dixon is an NPR guy. I said, who cares? Who cares about Brian Lear? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? He said, it's a it's a show for virology geeks. No, it's not, Brian Lear. <laughs> it's for everybody. <laughs> Come on. I don't say your show is... Uh, show for news geeks? <laughs> hey, is Twiv one of those driveway shows? You know that, you know that phenomenon where yes, you're pulling your driveway, driveway moment? moment? Driveway moment? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, you think some think people so. leave it on for a while when they pull in their driveway? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. but people aren't driving so much anymore, so it's yeah, it's really be. about walking the dogs. It's about yeah. walking the dogs. That's right. Brianne, can you actually? Take, uh, it's also about pulling weeds if you're into gardening. It's a wonderful weed pulling show. Yeah, uh, you pull weeds, huh, Rich? You bet. Brianne, you're next. All right, Michael writes. I am a psychiatrist working with the homeless mentally ill. It surprises me that we don't have many patients in our crowded group housing locations uh, that come down with mm. COVID-19. It seems like it should sweep through the community because they are not keeping good social distancing, et cetera. So I wonder if antipsychotic medications or on the other hand, methamphetamines are somewhat protective. Mm. Also, as someone who has spent a lot of time hanging out with Tibetans, particularly in the 80s, I remember finding out that Robert Thurman's daughter is an actress. <laughs> Love the podcast uh, from Michael, who's an MD. I, I have, I doubt that these drugs are protective. I think, I, I suspect they haven't been looked at, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, is there I, I testing? This, this yeah. is a good, good study. He's just speculating. Yeah, sure. no, no, I understand. <laughs> but I'm just, I, I want to answer in an intelligent manner. And I would say there probably hasn't been studied that much. And you're, you have a, so Michael has a have some patients and he hasn't noticed a lot of cases in them, but and so I don't know where he is. If he's in New York City, you know there are not a lot of cases in New York anymore. So 
There are a lot of things. Well, depending that, on what the age group and uh, and comorbidity is, it, it could be that there's uh, little enough. I'm really I'm making this up. Okay, little enough disease with a high background of other issues. So that, you know, maybe yes. it flies under the radar. Well, right? as, as always, if anyone has some insight, let us know or information. Pat writes, hello, Twivers. I want to start by thanking you all for providing such a delightful source of accurate scientific information, not just about this current pandemic, but all kinds of great info on viruses, research, and science in general. I am fervently hoping this spills over to the general public and inspires more understanding of what science is and does. Nope. <laughs> I totally Are you feeling pessimistic today? I never thought that the general population would be inspired by science and understanding what it does, even in a pandemic time. Uh, you know, how many people don't even want to wear a mask? So a I, mask. I'm, a, I'm a pessimist on this point, not in, I am in general not pessimistic, but I do think that, um, you know, we have a great audience, but it is a fraction of just the U.S. population. So anyway, uh, to, but I hope you're right. I, I, you know, I like Bob fully love said, he's, he really inspired me. He's so positive. We have these problems, yeah. but we can deal with them. Yeah. It's I thought great. fully love was, was I, I, you know, he was smiling the whole time. <laughs> yes. And so optimistic. The guy was great. Yeah, it was great. Um, the, the links below have me concerned that ADE antibody dependent enhancement is underplayed with SARS-CoV-2, both the instance of reinfection and possibly after vaccination. I'd be interested in your discussion. Um, all right, so we'll come to those. Let me finish the letter. Now to the irony. How is it that the same people that deny the scientific guidance provided by the scientists and doctors at CDC, FDA, immediately turn to the scientists and doctors when they become ill from COVID-19? Shouldn't they be asking the politicians, conspiracy tweeters, et cetera, for treatment? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, P.S. I listen yeah. to the end of each podcast. Trump, do as I say, not as I do. Okay. So we have actually discussed uh, multiple times uh, the potential of ADE with SARS-CoV-2. Now, that one of these links is um, a speculative uh, article. Is COVID-19 receiving ADE from other coronaviruses? Uh, from Strictly speculative. Strictly, no data. No data. Nothing. So I'm not going to worry about that. But the, the other article is um, – actually, I'm not worrying about either because this is uh, antibody-dependent enhancement of SARS-CoV-2 infection in recovered patients. So basically, they go in cells and culture, and they show that um, you can get antibody-dependent enhancement in cells and culture. And, you know, this doesn't really mean that it's going to happen. And, and what this means, ADE, is that – an antibody to the virus may facilitate its getting into cells that it normally doesn't infect and make the infection actually worse, which we know happens with dengue infections, right? And showing it happens in culture is one thing, but you need to show it happens in people, of course. Uh, and for example, in the Zika outbreak, a number of people showed that antibody-dependent enhancement could occur in cells and culture, but it never was verified in, in epidemiological studies in populations. So... There are other reasons to worry about it. In fact, the next email from Carolyn, she sends us an article about feline infectious peritonitis virus where there's clearly antibody-dependent enhancement. And that's a coronavirus, right? So it is not unprecedented in the um, coronavirus family. And there are some reports that suggest that it might occur with other coronaviruses, human coronaviruses. And so that is why, so my answer would be, we don't know for SARS-CoV-2, but that's why we have to do very careful safety studies. And we can't just say after the efficacy studies are done, yeah, let's license this. We should need to be a little more patient and wait until some of these vaccinated people get infected and we, we make sure that there's no enhanced disease because that's what you would worried about. And I would, uh, I would say, take this opportunity to point out that uh, there is a, a broader category of enhanced disease, not just antibody dependent, uh, which mm -hmm. basically covers the phenomenon that 
uh, some sort of pre-existing immunity, either from infection or vaccination, in some circumstances, uh, can lead to a situation where, in fact, the disease, when you get infected with a natural pathogen, uh, is worse than it would have been otherwise, okay? And yeah. I would also point out <clears throat> that scientists have been concerned about this in the case of this disease and others, but in particular in the context of the pandemic, since the get-go since the very beginning. And so their eyes are peeled and everybody is looking out for it. But I agree with you completely, Vincent, that it's an unknown. Uh, I would say that the fact that so far with a lot of pretty robust trials going on, that we have not seen any evidence for it in humans is encouraging, but the numbers by now must be so small uh, that you know, it's probably too early. And I agree. It's just something that people have to keep an eye on and they will. I'm confident they will. Uh, we, early on, Barney Graham wrote a nice commentary in science, which yes. we discussed. And I'll relink to that. It's very good to, to yes. read and see his perspectives because he has been working on vaccines and he worked on the respiratory syncytial vaccine in the 60s, which really caused enhanced disease, not because of antibody dependent enhancement, but for other reasons. And he's well aware of all of this. So let's write that link to Graham article. Uh, and I would say that you know, this uh, in the past has been the kind of thing that, and we've discussed this before, the numbers, even from a big clinical trial with 30 to 60,000 people, there may not be enough to actually yes. reveal yes. this kind of thing. And this That's is right. the kind of thing that sometimes doesn't show up until after a vaccine is deployed. Uh, and basically you have to do the best you can, but uh, 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 until it's widely distributed in the population, you can't be entirely confident that it's going to be safe. That's why there, there's basically a phase four to clinical evaluation of vaccines, which is post-licensure. The manufacturers are uh, obliged to follow up uh, people who are vaccinated right, and right. make sure even in that widely distributed population that it's still safe and that will happen. Right. And all of these phenomena that uh, Rich is talking about have to do with some kind of aspect of immune responses following um, vaccination or first infection um, in terms of that antibody enhancement or sort of enhancement with immune response with um, inflammation or something like that. Um, and so one of the reasons why we're not super concerned about this paper is that they're looking in a cell culture model and they don't actually show any changes to the response by the cells. They just show the virus can get into the cells. Um, and so as yet, we don't have evidence for a change in what the, the cell's response to infection would be. And the feline peritonitis virus is, uh, of, uh, although it's a coronavirus, different species, very different disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the pathogenesis yes. there is, is quite different. Yes. I wouldn't necessarily, although it's, you know, uh, it's worth keeping in mind, I wouldn't necessarily extrapolate that to SARS-CoV-2. All right, that brings us back to Kathy. Oh, and I'm still trying to figure out what the modification of that adenovirus vector is. <laughs> so um, I think we're on to Christy. Christy. Yes. yes. Yep. Hello, Triv crew. I've become such a huge fan in the last few months. It's gotten so my schedule revolves around new TWIV drops. I'm a former high school science teacher and organic chemistry PhD dropout living in Colorado Springs, where it is sunny and 57 Fahrenheit this afternoon, although it will be 10 Fahrenheit and snowing by the weekend. Uh, that snow by the weekend is a, a good thing with respect to the wildflower fires in Colorado. Uh, just an aside from me. Good, okay. good friend of mine lost her house in that. Oh. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Back to Christie's letter. Episode 673, Wake Up and Smell the Pandemic. It really struck a chord with me. In 2011, I developed a sort of obscure respiratory condition, which among other things causes me to grow a whole lot of polyps in my nasal passages and sinuses. As is typical for people with my condition, I had surgery to clear them out. And within a few months, they all grew back. One of the hallmark symptoms of the disease in is... Ana, anosmia. 
For eight years, I couldn't smell anything or breathe through my nose. When you were all dis- when you all were discussing your experiences with loss of smell and taste, I wanted to raise my hand like an overeager student. Ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. As you can imagine, it's no fun not being able to smell or taste. I used a lot more salt than a normal person and chose foods more based on texture than flavor. Not being able to smell can sometimes be dangerous. You can't smell a fire or a gas leak. Often can be sad. You can't smell the pies baking at Thanksgiving and occasionally be a blessing. Both of my boys went through their stinky adolescence and I got to miss smelling it. When the pandemic started and the loss of smell emerged as an early symptom, I was so glad that I can smell again so that I might be able to have that early warning of getting infected. Not that I I even go anywhere. I'm not messing around with this virus. I'm doing much better since about a year ago as I found a nice miracle drug made by, drumroll please, Regeneron. Yep, it's a monoclonal antibody that is helping to balance my screwed up inflammatory responses. I've been frustrated lately as my friends and usual news sources, who I generally appreciate for their well-deserved criticism of this administration, have been so quick to malign the president's experimental COVID treatment. It feels like they're putting it in the same category as hydroxychloroquine or that oleander nonsense. I understand having a healthy skepticism, especially now, but I've felt the need to defend Regeneron as a legitimate company doing legitimate science. You all know that, of course. Finally, at the end of the episode, Vincent mentioned one of my very favorite books from my childhood, The 21 Balloons. I treasure the copy that my mother read when she was a child and then read to me. It's a fun and fantastical story with a lot of, quote, science that isn't really science and full of imagination. Now I'm going to have to dig it out and read it again. Thank you all for letting us into your clubhouse. I so enjoy the thoughtful discussion, reasoned arguments, and camaraderie you all share. Gratefully, Christy. And so Vincent is now holding up his copy, first edition of the 21 Balloons, for those of you who are watching on YouTube. $4 at a flea market. What did I know? Beautiful illustrations by the author. It's great. Just great book, yeah. And uh, the reason I, I... it was on my shelf, right? And yeah. I, I did a little video where I went through s- some of the science books. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh my gosh, this is a, at the end, I said, oh, that the 21 balloons. Oh, it was on a twiv. I said, the 21 balloons, yes. and it's up there. Wow. And it's in great yeah. shape. $100, it could be yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, ha- I have first dibs. <laughs> did you ever read this, Kathy? No. Oh, you no. should read it. That's why I want... Well, if I were a nice person, I, I would send it to you. <laughs> I am a nice person, but, actually. But you should, you should hang on to it. No, if you really want it, I'll send it to you. It's fine. And then, anyway, um, Christy, this is really great to have this insight about the loss of sense of smell. Um, and so glad that you have it back. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, it's. I'd um, be interested to know the details of uh, what uh, antibody she's taking. Uh, clearly. Uh, well, not clearly, but I presume some sort of uh, immunomodulatory mm-hmm. um, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Probably anti-cytokine. Mm-hmm. They make several. Let's see. Anti-inflammatory monoclonal. Uh, it's too hard to find it. Never mind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like trying to find an adenovirus vector by a company, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, and while you were reading, Kathy, I went on a little side trip because I hear polyps and I think uh, papillomaviruses, mm. okay? Yeah. Um, but uh, they, according to the Mayo Clinic, they don't know what causes these things. And I trust the Mayo Clinic. If there were, if there were papillomaviruses that were obviously involved, I think they'd know about it. Mm-hmm. Rich, you're next. Uh, Owen writes, I sorted the, uh, he's got a uh, link in here uh, to a site called Worldometer that tracks the uh, coronavirus. Yeah, we've been at this site a long time ago. I sorted the site by total cases per 1 million population. And I noticed that 20 of the 24 states with the highest COVID-19 case rates and the 17 states with the highest case rates 
or all states that Trump won in 2016. I found this an interesting correlation and suggestive that a state's political affiliation might affect your likelihood of uh, contracting COVID-19. Owen, okay, I want to comment on this. Because I've seen, uh, I also saw, I think I distributed to you guys at one point, a, a graphic that basically sorted COVID-19 cases by uh, political affiliation and showed that as the uh, pandemic went on, uh, red states, as they were classified, were the uh, predominant COVID-19 states. Uh, this is epidemiology of a sort, uh, if you like. And I will remind people that during the summer, um, uh, I won't say during the summer, that on any given time, uh, the sale of ice cream cones is proportional to the number of drownings in a given community, okay? And uh, that does not mean that eating ice cream makes you drown, okay? It means that there's something else going on, uh, which is that it's hot, okay? And you go swimming and eat ice cream cones. And I wonder about the confounding variables in this sort of analysis. Not that I'm a fan of the uh, current administration's attitude towards uh, um, the pandemic, and I will repeat, wear a mask, okay? However, I wonder whether this doesn't have to do with the demographics, rural states in particular, um, and that uh, I think the pandemic has been slow to get out into the country. Uh, and uh, into the countryside, into the more rural areas. I think it's hit the uh, urban areas uh, uh, first and that we're finding now that there's an uh, increase in spread and problems in areas that were mm, previously geographically uh, protected. And I wonder if there's not a correlation between sort of rural voting habits uh, and the uh, rural spread habits uh, of the virus. That, that's, I can't be more specific than that, but I think that there's, uh, although it's possible that uh, the politics uh, plays into this, I would like to see an analysis done with uh, taking into account all of those other sorts of demographic variables. So I have done the sort on this, and um, I agree with Rich's uh uh, causation does not equal, um, correlation does not equal causation. Um, and the the top 20 states include some with pretty low population, North and South Dakota being at the top. Um, number eight, uh, this is again, sort of total cases per 1 million population. Um, number eight is Florida with population of 21 million. Number 17 is Texas with a population of 29 million. Um, and the I think just looking at this, the one state in the top 20 um, that I think did not go for Trump is probably Illinois. Um, so I, I agree um, that it, it's an interesting uh, correlation, but we can't be sure about causality. That having been said, wear a mask. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what state you live in. Yeah. Brienne, you're next. All right. Lisa writes, Dear all, driving to the Tennessee State Girls Volleyball Tournament, the weather is 85 degrees and sunny. The tournament is spread out over more locations this year with limited tickets to de-densify the crowds, mandatory masks except for the athletes who are actually playing and the referees, and touch-free entry using your cell phone. The finals are today and we are hoping for a win. Our private schools continue surveillance testing using saliva and RT-PCR with same-day turnaround and report the cycle threshold. We remain at less than 1% and those students are isolated and contact traced. Due to mitigation practices, including regular testing, both schools' football teams were able to play their annual grudge match. It has been played 86 times since 1908. The game was moved to the college football stadium to allow a well-spaced crowd health checks were performed for entry, and masks were required for all except the athletes. Moving forward, we've created protocols for receiving new international students for boarding next semester, based on what we have learned since August. 
With appropriate quarantine and entry testing, the schools can offer them in-person education on the controlled campus environment. We are working towards lowering risk for winter sports. Some good news, the gowns that Lisa designed now have a new milestone. The company producing them has secured a contract with the Department of Defense and they will become part of the national stockpile. You may recall that the original design, created after seeing the nurses wearing trash bags in New York, makes a few key cuts in any surgical drape so you could turn it into a gown. The design lends itself to rapid manufacture and now will become part of our nation's resources. Working toward the goal Dixon set for us, Purdue is doing well. Football will start this weekend with outdoor viewing of the games as large gatherings are prohibited and athletes are tested per their protocols. Purdue has a combined surveillance and symptomatic testing positivity of 2.36% and a big Q where the whole house is quarantined because everyone is mixing and no one can sort it out. Doesn't happen so much anymore as the congregate living students have embraced mitigation strategies. We call it little Q when the houses follow the recommendations of masking in common areas and other strategies to allow for selective quarantine of a few exposed individuals instead. We have been using a scoring system for symptoms that can be found on the dashboard with our campus health center statistics here. And she gives a link to the Purdue dashboard. And we'll tally the results at Thanksgiving and share them. The students will go online, go to online class to finish out the semester. An unanticipated finding, 25% of infected dorm students discovered by surveillance testing are new members of the Greek organizations that had the lowest adherence to recommendations. We will be able to advise incoming students as they embrace college life of this data. Still, we have no in-class transmission and attribute spread of disease to social activities and combat that spread with education and testing. Our clients with one-to-one -one health continue to keep their businesses running using Tetris principles. Overcoming corona fatigue is the biggest challenge for them. We are preparing for the winter with flu shots and continued layers of good practices. We are fortunate to work with people who always want to stay one step ahead of what's coming next. We both sit on the county's mayor's pandemic advisory board and continue to appreciate the many sides of the coronavirus response. We, along with three other physicians, two infectious disease docs like Daniel and a hospitalist, advise leaders in hotel management, tourism, county schools, the Chamber of Commerce, building contractors, a whole group comes together weekly in an effort to keep the kids in school, the parents at work, and the economy growing, all while keeping infection down. Our public support of the community mask mandate is seen as critical, and we hold rather regular press conferences demonstrating the downward trend that continues since the mask mandate was passed. We have included a link to the latest tourism video. Although you said you don't want to travel during this pandemic, seeing this commercial will change your mind and have you hopping in your car. Um, and she gives a link. Finally, the future with one-to-one -one health. Lisa's perception of the pandemic from the surgeon's standpoint is one of a mass casualty, a slow moving rolling disaster where resources are at times overwhelmed in places. Trauma systems have evolved to review and report their findings after mass casualty events to allow all cities to learn from their experiences. It's time for everyone to share pandemic data in this fashion as an interim review. We have looked back at our efforts in April and May when we were keeping factories and businesses going and taken what we did right, masks, what we did wrong, hygiene theater, and what we wish we did had a shorter lockdown and directed resources to public education. We are now helping organization as outside objective consultants to improve their response. Our goal remains to inspire others, as you have said, especially surgeons with trauma experience, to lead in their communities as our surgical perspective remains a valuable one in this slow moving mass casualty called the, called the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. It is easy to look back and identify problems. It is constructive to use that knowledge to change what we are doing for the better. It is not useful to use words like idiots or failure of leadership as not everyone's perspective is the same as the Monday morning quarterback. Listening this week to the physician, Megan from Montana, I want to tell her that her experience isn't unique. It is important to continue to do the right thing, to advise the community as best you can. Not every colleague, committee, or client follows the advice we give. We just keep doing what we feel is right and scientifically accurate, and we feel like we have made a difference. We think that TWIV does too, and we are glad that you are in this with us. Keep positive, stay healthy, and see it can be done. 
Um, and this is from Lisa Smith and David Bruce, who are on an earlier episode of TWIV. They also have a PS. I know that this was a huge email, but this warrants mention. We've begun a weekly newsletter and a COVID response webpage. Our committees and clients receive it well, and we are reporting the science in terms that non-scientists can understand. Here is the link. Um, and she gives us a link. Um, and Lisa and David were on uh, TWIV episode 656. So I, I take a couple of things from this. First, that so we recognize now that we don't have to shut down completely. As long as you do certain things, you can come back at certain levels like masking and distancing and testing and so forth. And I think a lot of the resistance to believing that this is even an issue comes from people who don't want to shut everything down. And this shows that you don't have to do that. So that's one thing. And the other they make committees, their local county made committees of people who know what they're talking about and they listen to them. And that doesn't happen everywhere. So I think that's really important. I bet the, the governor of North Dakota, who we just heard about earlier, didn't have a committee of the right people to listen to. So you, who you advise you is really important. And so just becoming more and more convinced that the uh, sort of community behavior dynamics of this are really critical in managing the whole thing. And uh, uh, nobody has a right to complain who's not wearing a mask, okay? It, it, every, you know, it, it's just really critical. And I think there is a path through this. Some, some activities, unfortunately, are going to suffer. The top of the list is bars. Okay, and that's where economic relief comes in, because uh, it's not their fault they run a yeah, bar. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. it just happens to be uh, a particular has a particularly uh, hazardous activity. But if everybody, if you really want to do something about that, then the whole community has to get together and adopt the appropriate behavior so that we get out of this sooner rather than later and support the people who are hurt the most. It can be done. And I, I think the. The sorority, the fraternity sorority thing is just typical. These social get togethers yeah. are the big problems, right? People kind right. of relax and don't wear their masks and they don't stay apart. Do uh, I would uh, remind people of uh, Daniel Griffin's uh, uh, rap, which is the same that we're getting from the uh, local director of uh, public health here, which is that uh, you do see, in, uh, since schools opened, you were seeing an increase in cases in school aged children, but it's not in the schools. It's in the associated activities because people figure, oh, we're going back to school. We can now have birthday parties and stuff. No, you can't. And actually, I talked to somebody. It was on one of these um, chat with a virologist talks who said, that, you know, they're taking all the appropriate uh, activities, uh, all the appropriate precautions in the classrooms and stuff. And they're even having lunch outside. But it's nearly impossible to police that activity because you got to take your mask off to eat lunch. And it's hard to police the kids appropriately to keep their distance during that activity. You just can't let up your guard. It has to be uniformly applied. Um, and, then, and then maybe you can get somewhere. Yep. All right. One more from Sal. Dear Twiverati. Firstly, thank you. I've been a listen to the ender of TWIV and associated podcasts since early January, right back when you were not sure this would be the one. Wow. I don't even remember January. I remember. I have to go back and I remember and listen. being dead wrong in February. <laughs> I'm emailing you from the Tree Cathedral in Milton Keynes, England, where it is 13 degrees and sunny with a good smattering of autumn colors. Thank you so much for your pain review, TWIV674. As a person with chronic neuropathic pain, I was delighted. What a potential gift to humanity if this one small benefit came out of the pandemic. All current neuropathic analgesia has significant sedating and similar side effects. So a completely new pathway is very exciting, but leads to my question. I went from excited to worried. If it's elements of the spike makeup that is the active element of analgesia, would spike-based vaccines render any breakthrough ineffective? I'm sure it's a dumb question. I understand much more about nerve conduction studies than viruses. 
Also, there are loads of specialist support groups for the various diseases and injuries leading to chronic neuropathic pain. So researchers, shout out to myelopathy.org or others. We're, we are a naturalistic worldwide experiment cohort uh, being infected right now. So no, it's not a problem because the idea is that the spike, as Kathy mentioned, will lead to production of small molecules you know, that are based on how the spike interacts with neuropillin. And they will be used for treatment. And the antibodies to the spike should not interfere with that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. Second ask, you wonder how many Vincent Racaniello's there are. I think I may be the only Sally Ann Rodborn, Rodburn, if you're in Australia, you would say Rodburn. I don't know what they do in the UK. In the world, certainly Google can't find another. Does anyone in the Twiviverse know of a namesake or also think they have a unique name? <clears throat> And Dixon wrote, I am the only Dixon de Pommier, as far as I can tell. Back to the letter. Then an offer. Transcribing and or summarizing your podcast is important, but too much for one. How about a citizen science style team effort? I'd be happy to organize it if other TWIV listeners wanted to join in. A few dozen of us, we could do it reliably and quickly. A few hundred, we could even tackle the back catalog. Tell Vincent if you're in... Uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, let me know what you need to do to organize it. You can just do it on your own. You don't need anything from us, right? No. Remember, you got these machine translations that can start. And then on YouTube, there's a tra an auto translation, which you can download and use as a start. Transcription. Transcription, yes. <laughs> you, made the, you made the common error that undergrads make, confusing yes. transcription and translation. <laughs> yeah, yes. But I do know the difference, yes. Oh, uh, Yes. Finally, we know your views on this, so you don't need to review them. But in case you haven't heard, a team from Imperial College London are very serious about human challenge studies. My reading is that they have yet to finalize ethical approval, but I may be wrong as their pre press briefings have been very strong and gives a link to that. And yes, we have talked about that. Thank you again. Yours in science and constant learning. Sally Ann, quote, another email has ended, end quote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the TWIV sign off. All right. Let's there is another Brianne Barker. There uh, is. I have found before. Um, yes, she wow. played um, volleyball in Oklahoma. Hmm. Um, and so I assume she is considerably taller than I am. There's another Richard Condit, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who in fact is actually uh, was a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. Yeah, that's uh, funny. Where I went was an undergraduate. And this guy is a... Uh, forest ecologist. Uh, and so I've gotten some pretty strange papers to review uh, mm. in my career. <laughs> but he and I have acknowledged each other and uh, I've uh, sent people on the right path when I when that happens. And there's another Catherine Spindler. When I wanted to get my email unique name when I moved to Michigan, I couldn't do it because there was a Catherine Spindler who had gotten the name I would have liked and she had been associated briefly with the microbiology and immunology wow. department. Wow. And whether she's the same one, um, my REI account uh, about five years ago was conflated with another Catherine Spindler's. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure who reaped the benefits of getting the, the uh, dividends, but I finally got it sorted out. So at least two in the Southeast uh, Michigan area. That's funny. All right, let's do some picks. Brianne, what do you have this week? I have a, a five minute long YouTube video called Kids Meet a Virologist. <laughs> um, it, it was done by a virologist um, named Semi Tureen um, from uh, University of Washington in the Fred Hutchinson. And he talks to, um, I think it's four or five kids uh, at different ages about uh, the fact that he is a virologist and they ask questions about viruses and then they talk about what they uh, know about viruses and it's just really cute and really fun to watch. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's something that will put a smile on your face thinking about viruses, if nothing else, um, nice. to hear uh, these kids, some of whom are quite knowledgeable, um, talk uh, and talk about what they think a virologist does and what they um, know about viruses. It's, it's just fun. Cool. That's neat. Cool. Kathy, what do you have? I picked a link about the Harvard 
glass marine invertebrates that are in a museum somewhere on the Harvard campus. Um, and these were made by Rudolf and Leopold Blaschka. And I have seen other ones of these uh, glass mm. things, uh, the botanical ones are what I saw in person, but years ago. Anyway, these have all been put online in 3D. So uh, there are 15 of them and they're fabulous. And so you don't have to go to Harvard to see these. And they um, took 250 to 700 images of each invertebrate, used really good lighting, and in some cases even used X-ray um, computer tomography scans to get these images. So there's you know, a number of octopi and, and just other really beautiful things. So oh, these are gorgeous. Absolutely out. gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. So pretty. Yeah. The glass it's, flowers I've seen as well. They're also mm -hmm. at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. so they say that this article is entitled a um, uh, model of how museums can share their collections more widely. That's great, right? Because yeah. mm -hmm. it's important right now. I love it. That's really cool. Rich, what do you have? Yeah, for all I know, we've done this sometime in the past, but it was lingering in my uh, Twiv Picks uh, <laughs> folder. Uh, and that is, uh, this is a, an article in a publication called Real Clear Science, but you can access this. Uh, that's sort of the lay version. You can access this in various ways, including Wikipedia. But it describes a fungus that uh, they discovered growing on the walls of Chernobyl, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor, that uh, at very least must have been enduring massive amounts of radiation. Mm. Uh, and in fact, there's some suggestion that in fact it could use uh, radiation as an energy source <laughs> uh, and actually essentially feed on it. And there have been uh, numerous other descriptions of this since. So I thought that was at least entertaining. What it does to me that I really like is reminds me, you know, when I think about the uh, humans blowing themselves up, which is, I think, a distinct possibility, uh, or you know, blowing themselves up slowly with uh, climate change, I take heart in the hmm. understanding that DNA will continue to replicate uh, and uh, life will go on in some form or another. And this is a good example of just how uh, extreme environments uh, organisms can find and thrive in. So I thought it was kind of cool. So they, they, they reference a paper, which I, I put the link in here, because Arturo Casadevall and colleagues have worked on this, studying these fungi, and I didn't realize they reference it in the article. I remember him talking about this. He said the first time the they sent robots in to, to take pictures inside to see what was going on, and the walls were all black. They're covered with this fungus, which was growing in this incredibly hot radioactive area. That'll be what's left on the earth after the Holocaust, right? The atomic yeah, Holocaust. That'll be a good, good starting point for, uh, you know, after we clean the whole place out with the uh, Holocaust, start off with the fungi. That's a big, you know, that's a couple of billion years head start. Yeah. And uh, then uh, work up from there. Actually, I, I have to relate this uh, one little personal story of uh, organisms growing in harsh environments. Uh, Vincent and maybe Kathy, I'm sure you remember the big old electrophoresis tanks. These mm -hmm. things were about as big as a suitcase oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, with a, a buffer chambers in them and a, and a sort of a drying rack that you looped your wetted uh, chromatogram over, uh, over the top uh, with the uh, edges in the buffer tanks. And then to cool it, you filled the whole thing up with what we call Varsol, which is some sort of mix, uh, some sort of organic slop, okay? that serves as a coolant, but doesn't mix with the water. And <laughs> in one of these tanks in uh, Jones lab, I noticed one day that there was fungus growing at the interface of the buffer and the Varsol. Okay. <laughs> now buffer is a citrate buffer. So that's a great carbon source. And as a matter of fact, for all I know, they were getting something out of the Varsol. That's got a lot of carbon in it as well. Mm. Obviously it's an anaerobic environment. Not only that, there was buffer growing and uh, there were a fungus growing on 
each side, each electrode, and one electrode had a white fungus and the other one had a black fungus. I'm not making this up. <laughs> and what did you do? What did you do? Did you clean it up? I just, no, I just, I just, uh, uh, um, praised Mother Nature at how ingenious she was, and then would, ran ran my own. Yeah, not only that, but it's getting thousands of volts running through this thing. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want to clean it up. It could change your experiments. Yes, that's right. right. Make them stop working. You clean it up, it won't work anymore. Yep, yep. Right. That's a typical <laughs> one. Very cool. Uh, my pick, I may have picked before, but since we have all brand new people, and no one remembers more than a year ago, <laughs> Right. And no one looks back at the pics. I even stopped. I used to maintain a pick page. I haven't updated yeah. it in a long time. Sorry. Um, because nobody was looking at it. Anyway, my pick is Artologica, which is a, a website of this, of Michelle Banks, who's a, a science artist who I've known for quite a while. And she made the watercolor, which is on the wall behind me, which is all different viruses. I actually, I bought that years ago when I was in uh, D.C. for a meeting. There was an exhibition in Crystal City, and I went there, and and so and she had exhibited, and she wasn't there, but I went back to my hotel, and I emailed her. I said, I want to buy that. So she brought it to ASM headquarters for me, and that's what that is behind me. But I have lots of other stuff of hers, which is so cool. I, have a, I bought a big bacteriophage at the ASV in Maryland, and I have a... Another one over there. My kids got me one of hers for Christmas. This, I think my daughter last Christmas got me one because the package came from Michelle Banks. So I emailed Michelle. I said, ah, I see something for me for Christmas. She said, I'm not saying. <laughs> so I got a bunch <laughs> of her stuff. And we did a twiv with her uh, as well. Um, five, 352 where uh, we went to her apartment in Georgetown and we filmed her. And... Uh, talking about her art. And then afterwards, she did a little thing. For, she made some art for us and showed us how she uses colors and stuff. Anyway, it's really cool. There are lots of great science artists, and maybe I will go through a lot of them in the next few picks. But um, Michelle is, is terrific. Artologica. There's, there's a lot of, of course, since you originally picked it, a lot of new stuff here too. It's great. And she has a whole new I actually new have some masks from her. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. She has a whole new section that. inspired by COVID. Of course, the in the beginning of the pandemic, we I always used an art piece for the post, mm -hmm. which was one of her watercolors of multiple virus particles, which I I still very much like. Anyway, very nice, good stuff, and very nice. I she I last saw her at the ASV in Maryland, University of Maryland. She was there mm -hmm. with a few other science artists um, exhibiting. Yeah, that was fun. It was just great. She said, stand by my, by my stand. You're a magnet. People come to talk to you and then they'll buy my stuff. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Okay. We, we have a listener pick. I guess you put this in, Kathy, because it's purple, right? I did. Uh, Justin sent it to me. It's a, a movie about what went wrong in the USA's pandemic response. Uh, the ousted BARDA director, Rick Bright, who we've mentioned before, is extensively quoted in the film. It's called Totally Under Control. And it seems to have been filmed uh, to some extent, um, I, I, from what I read somewhere in one of the reviews, um, kind of uh, hidden or surreptitiously or something. Interviews with journalists, news has news footage, uh, interviews with scientists, medical authorities, and a lot of familiar imagery of the pandemic um, and so forth to lay out what went wrong in the USA's pandemic response. The main thrust is that it didn't have to be this way. And uh, you, if you go to this site, you can at least watch the trailer. And then there's several different ways that you can uh, watch it. So I've only watched the trailer, but um, I've seen uh, press about it in several different places. Cool. So thanks I would Justin. say it's still going wrong mm -hmm. yeah. and we may not have seen the worst of it yeah. and every day is a new day uh, yeah. and uh, we can all get on board with this anytime we want and yeah. uh, have an effect. But it's got to be everybody working together. All right. Thank you, Justin. That'll do it for TWIV 676. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you want to send us questions or comments, twiv at microbe.tv. If you want to support us, 
two ways you can do that through the month of November. The traditional way, microbe.tv slash contribute. A couple of ways you can help us there. You can do repeating stuff for one time or use affiliate links or buy swag. It's cool. cool. Or you can go to parasiteswithoutborders.com through the end of November. They'll match your donation, your one-time donation. And we appreciate all of your support because you are our only means of support in addition to my chair here. <laughs> Brianne Barker's at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on the Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. And Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>